Okay, let's talk education, guys. Um, My favourite we've, topic. We've, we've had um, a pretty amazing 12 months. Unprecedented. Unpredicted. All those words. Uh, I'd really like to hear about what has what we what we were doing prior to this, what's happening now, and what you guys see as the future of education. Green School is a unique um, location. We pride ourselves on nature-connected learning. We pride ourselves on outdoor activities. Uh, we pride ourselves on experience learning. But about 12 months ago, all that kind of stopped. And I'd really like to know from you guys, maybe starting with you, Michael, 12 months ago, how did you feel when what, what you knew, what you were good at and what you were here to do kind of stopped and something else started to happen? Um, how was that moment for you? Just throw me right into it. Thanks, Pat, Andy. <laughs> um, I think like, like anyone in education, I was super excited about the opportunity for the change that was about to happen and completely turn our worlds upside down without any time to plan or prepare at all. So yeah, re really excited, I'd say. Is that, is that true? No, not at all, <laughs> not at all. Um, I think that what I was most concerned about initially was how relationships were going to change. And um, recognizing that those relationships are the, the foundations of our community and how we build spaces both physically and virtually for students to feel accepted and acknowledged and valued and feel safe to to make mistakes and learn and grow um, I feel like that was something that was immediately a concern um, and one of those relationships that I think is essential for the ongoing student support is the the relationship between the parent or caregiver and the teacher and I think that's a relationship that took a big hit throughout our transition and, and the time of change. Um, and not with intention, but just, I think, due to lack of opportunity as we adjusted. And um, I think that, you know, it was essentially been reduced to a, a chain of emails back and forth when something's pressing. And we all know how fun and challenging it can be to interpret, and interpret someone's tone from their text. Um, so... So that change has been, has been a big challenge. And I think one way that we are continuing to, to build and cultivate those relationships here at Green School is through our parent-teacher conferences. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they are viewed as a celebration of learning and a celebration of growth. And they include not only the parent or caregiver, but also the student as well. Um, we don't focus solely on proficiencies, but it's more of a direct and specific demonstration of how students are modeling our, our green school skills and values. Mm -hmm. So they have an opportunity to complete a reflection and share how they feel they're um, demonstrating those skills and values. And then the conference itself acts like a, a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. So we have parents and teachers and students, they all have the opportunity for, for sharing, for asking questions, for uh, reflecting and it's a really positive experience yeah. um, and I think that it leaves us energized and it leaves us excited for learning in the next term and it's a, a celebration of achievement and of potential yeah I think that's something that it took a little while for us to figure out how to do that to, to connect back to parents uh, Rahayu what about you when when things sort of uh, changed 12 months ago being a science and math teacher, was that something that worried you or did you feel like it was something that you could, you could deal with? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, last year, I've been like, um, this is really challenging for me as a, as for, yeah, let's say um, math teacher, because it's really hard though, like not just for a student, like learning math throughout the distance and also like me as a teacher and also for the science itself, because last year I planned to create like a um, service trip to Borneo and then suddenly it's just like COVID happened on Mars and then suddenly, yeah, what can you do? And then, because science also, you need to do like hands-on activities, mm -hmm. you need to experiment, like how mm -hmm. can you do that? So mm -hmm. it's a bit like um, challenging for me to figure out like what's, what should um, I do uh, best for uh, our kids, yeah, for yeah. our students. So um, yeah, but now I'm learning from it and I agree with the Michael before, like from the parents' conference, you know, like the reflection. Mm -hmm. 
for about a year and then I mean, look at that and then like, continue for uh, at Green School, we, we have a mantra, bend like bamboo, and we often say that, meaning be flexible and, you know, be resilient. Is that how you felt? Or did you, do you remember back to that time, did you feel like it was super challenging? Did you feel like it was something you could handle, having the change to online learning? Um, at the moment, I mean, um, on the first day, yes, it is super challenging for me. And then everything just changed, and then everything just via distance, via Zoom, Google Meet, and everything changed. But, like, lately, I'm used to it. And I believe also my students are used to it. Because yep. I think um, by the pocket itself, in the um, last semester, um, I used that as the opportunity to learn. Because um, probably before, I'm not really used to developing the growth mindset, but now it is time. Because our, um, I mean, for math itself, maybe you're not really used to it, mm -hmm. but now maybe we could develop that more. And then still, I mean, yeah, I mean, the. Um, Waiting, but like we can put that a bit away aside. Mm -hmm. But like maybe a growing mindset and I mean try to develop connection is the best. Yeah. The growth mindset thing is something that really popped up, isn't it? It's like we always we preach it to our to our students, but when it actually happens to you and you're the one who has to deal with it, that's when it, the um, it gets real. And um, I imagine um, that Francis, some that would have been something that would be would have been most tricky for you in many ways because you're such an outdoorsy, um, nature-connected person. Yeah. Um, how did you find it when you, I mean, I suppose you were probably thinking this might go on for a while, no one really knew how long. How did you feel? Did you have plans? Did you have things that you wanted to accomplish that were suddenly put on hold? Oh, so many things that involve being in person um, <coughs> and going out and being out and about on the island with the kids totally shut down. Um, and, and just in everyday classes, I was I was terrified, mm. and I kept thinking, how am I going to teach? How am I going to teach? Mm. And it took me a while to actually learn something from our kids, our students, who are infinitely more more adaptable than we are. Mm. Um, and I realised that I don't need to worry about how I'm going to teach. I need to worry about how they're going to learn, mm. and how I'm going to learn how to help them learn because it's shifted a lot. Um, to that, kids have to learn how to learn by themselves mm -hmm. more, mm -hmm. and we're their little box in the corner trying to encourage them and keep them going. Um, yeah, I, I took many lessons. I was terrified. I, yep. You know, everything I had planned got shut down, and being a language teacher, I, I was stumped. Mm -hmm. For a week, I sat at home just being worried, feeling mm -hmm. anxious, thinking, how, how do I teach someone those basic phrases that they need my first two weeks of class yep. in any language class is teaching them how to say I don't understand can you repeat that and building this kind of fun make mistakes feel comfortable you know atmosphere yep. and I had no idea how to do that um, and I knew it wasn't going to be you know take a screenshot of the book and hold it up you know and say we're starting at the top here on exercise yep. one and moving through so uh, a lot of lessons had to be learned, um, but mainly from, from the students because they adapt so quickly. Mm. And they, what Rahayu was saying, you know, things that seemed impossible for one week, when you actually jump in and start doing them and you permit yourself to make the mistakes, as Michael was saying, you, you, you exemplify lifelong learning, you exemplify learning by doing, mm -hmm. you know. And, and one of the things I found worked best was saying to the students you know you know more about this than I do mm. so help me out here and you you open yourself you show a certain vulnerability mm. and, and you're there to help them find the best way they can yeah you yep. know to, to to learn to to take some joy and to get some enthusiasm and and honestly start teaching themselves yeah that's right I mean that's I that, was that was the, the big the, shift yep that was the biggest shift was that mm. it went from teachers guiding to um probably more students guiding themselves and, and parents guiding their students. And I suppose, you know, we've got some parents here on the panel. Francis, as a parent, did you, do you think that helped knowing or having kids at home who are learning as well as you being a teacher? Is that something that you saw changing? So I, I have to confess, when the whole thing hit, I was not a parent. <laughs> I delegated all the parental yeah. tasks to my partner, yeah. my wife, because um, I was struggling so much to, to, to see what it's like as a teacher and try to imagine what it's like as a student. Mm -hmm. After about the first couple of weeks, then yes, I started 
you know, in, in my periods off running downstairs and seeing where my fourth grader was and was he on Minecraft or was he on the call? Oh, I didn't find the link. Well, you know, it, it was, to be honest, it, it, it took me a good while to sort out my role as a teacher um, before I could, you know, be a parent yeah. or, or a better parent in that situation. A lot of it has to wear, uh, isn't there? I mean, you know, what, how did we, how did you and how did we all adapt to what we needed to do? I mean, I know engagement, we, we touched on how kids are at home. There's, it's a lot harder to engage kids when they're at home. In the classroom, there's a sense of momentum with the whole class doing something and everyone's doing it together. And then at home, it's sort of like, yeah, everyone's doing things maybe, but they're kind of separated. But I would love to know how you, like, what did you start to think about with your teaching? What did you start to sort of, how did you adapt it? And how did you try and, did you experiment or did you use different things to see how they went? Or, you know, what happened then? Uh, yeah, if I can share one story. So let's say for my math class last semester. So uh, my class is called a boomerang math, which is uh, we are working with the quadratic function. And then I was thinking, because usually I can ask them to create a project, creating a boomerang, and then like do the function and then do the analysis from it. But suddenly now all of them are home. And then I couldn't like give them a material for it. So what could I do? So I was thinking maybe I, we could do something else. So I'm just like trying to search and then yeah, finally I, I, I found a catapult. Mm. So yeah, that's really uh, simple. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of like a um, simple machine. Mm -hmm. you, you just need popples, uh, popsicle sticks and a rubber band and then um, um, battle caps. That's really easy to find at home. And then they try to build the catapult, try it, measure the high and then how long it takes and then just trying to analyze the mm -hmm. um, quadratic, ex I mean, quadratic function. Mm -hmm. That's really fun. And then all of my students I mean, very happy with it. So they can have a try, even like we cannot like really connect at school. So, but yeah, we could do something else like project. Yeah, and is that, would that uh, catapult task, would that have worked in the classroom or would you, would you ever use that in the classroom or was it something that was bespoke for online because it's more achievable on your own or? Um, before, I'm not thinking about that yeah. yet, but suddenly when we need, I mean, when we are in the distance, so we have to think like double, you know, not just like um, the cool project, but also the project that's easy for them, for yeah. a student to take and then to get, to get the research mm -hmm. like around, a, around their home. And then that's also the same thing with the science. So how can I ask my student to check their, their pH of something, like for example, for the soil? So I was thinking, Probably we have something else like more green chemistry, mm -hmm. not using like um, s um, certain like hard chemical, like dangerous chemical. Yeah, and then we we found out we can use baking soda, we can use vinegar to measure mm -hmm. and then check the pH. So that's really fun experience, and I also like I mean find out that is also um, true that we can yeah. make it. That's interesting. And did you find the students were engaged? I mean, they sound like they'd be engaged by something like that. It's super hands on super real it's using stuff from the kitchen or stuff from you know the storeroom in your house or whatever yeah. engagement i imagine would have been pretty high for that one yeah yeah, yeah it is uh, uh yeah i mean they are engaged and also uh because before if i can reflect like in the beginning they're not really engaged at all mm -hmm. probably yeah. they shock i shock mm -hmm. and then probably me as a teacher was shocked mm -hmm. and then they know like what is the best for them right and then lately, after I like shared them, my growth man said, hey, we are together. Now we're going to learn together math, not just me. I'm not the expert here. I'm not the master. We're going to learn together mm -hmm. and then try to discuss together and then see what mistake that you have. And then we go for it together. So did, Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So did you, sounds like we're getting a theme here that the kids were very much involved in trying to figure this problem out. Did you, yeah. did you guys, did you find that, Michael, where you had the children sort of helping you along in the journey? I think that, that's an important part of it too, is that, um, you know, we are demonstrating the skills and values that we want our students to, to be um, modeling as well. So, I mean, in a sense, it was, it was identifying and, and confidently sharing what we were struggling with and, and bringing it as, you know, presenting it as a problem, um, asking for different perspectives and ideas from students to be able to contribute to solving that problem as a team. And that asking for help is okay, um, and I think demonstrating that is incredibly important. And as you know, Pat Francis said earlier, we need to to reach out and let them know that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to struggle, um, 
but it's it's not okay to do it by yourself. Yeah. And um, I think that very early on, we recognized that we wanted students to focus on thinking critically, and not just about the the information. I mean, we wanted them to be able to analyze the information and ask questions about this constant flow that was just coming at them in this new digital environment. But we also wanted them to be able to think critically about their interactions that they were having as well. And I think that um, we want them to develop the capacity to assess situations and to um, respond thoughtfully to them as well. And I think a way that we encourage that was by providing opportunities for students to participate in constructive controversy, where they, we encourage them to actively engage with each other and challenge each other, but also you know, um, consider different perspectives and ideas, recognize bias and remove personal opinion, but also, um, you know, again, the most important part is recognizing they're human beings on the other side of this interaction mm -hmm. and on the other side of these devices, and we need to approach that with, with empathy and with, with patience. Mm -hmm. So I think from there, you know, we were also able to focus on things like media literacy and thinking critically in terms of evaluating and interpreting the messages that are being shared with them. Um, and we put a real emphasis on digital citizenship too, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, wanting students to be able to recognize the information they're sharing, the media that they're sharing online, yeah. recognize signs of cyberbullying and how to be an upstander, mm -hmm. but also to find balance in their in their device usage and their media usage. Yeah. And so I think it was really important for us to arm students with the tools and strategies that they needed to keep themselves safe yeah. online. Let's talk about that because I think it's very interesting that you say uh, device usage because I, I imagine most teachers and parents felt like this is this is the major problem is that we're and particularly somewhere like Green School we're trying to get people basically trying to get them off the screen as much as possible sure use mm -hmm. the screens at school or use them at home but how did you guys how did you come to terms with that knowing that you would be online a lot more than usual and the kids would be too I struggled. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny what Michael said about empathy. The, the challenge was trying to, you know, in, in a classroom setting, you walk in and with a bit of experience, you look around the room, you know those kids, you can see something's wrong with X, maybe their puppy just died, or, you know, you, you can tell almost immediately what the mood of the room is when you walk in to teach after, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, after you've done it for a, yep. for a little while. And that was all gone, and that was a huge challenge. But again, if we were open and honest about that and saying, I have no idea how any of you are feeling today, we talk about empathy all the time. And I kind of, it took me a while to flip that over and go, this is actually a, ch this is, this challenge is an opportunity to talk about, hey, try and guess how everybody else is feeling mm -hmm. by looking at the little square. And then we would sort of try and tell jokes and see if we could keep a deadpan face and see who's the best at hiding their feelings on, in the little square online. And that was, a, that was a fun way of highlighting, hey, you know what? Check in with how you're feeling, mm -hmm. me as a teacher and my students as well, but also have a little think about how everyone else is feeling. Right. Because if you're bouncing around in your little square and showing your favorite puppy dog you know, toy, you're totally distracting everybody else from doing their thing. But also if you're like this for the entire class, yeah you're going to make it r sooner or later. You'll see all the other little squares go a little bit That's dead. That's right, it's contagious. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and it's a new normal about how we even express our feelings, like with masks. I mean, it's, it's absolutely look amazing to be speaking a lot to you more, right now. And nice. see, yeah, I can, I can read all your facial expressions, but when, you're, when you've got the screen, it's a different kettle of fish and the mask. Your eyes tell a lot of the story. And it's nice when you get to take the mask off and you see the rest of the person's face and you can actually appreciate that a lot more and how much more information you get one of the upsides of having the online learning was you could actually see the kids' faces yep. and ears. You know, yep. it's sort of, I actually look forward to seeing them. In fact, they, some of the kids look very different week to week as they grow up so fast. You, yes. know, you can see their whole face. Okay, so we've talked about um, what, what, what it was like to start with and how it felt going forward and what we started to do. Francis, can I stay with you? Because I'd like to know about sure. SOAP. And um, could you tell us a little bit about that and then tell us also about um, how, how if, you, if you did or you are doing, how did you adapt that to distance learning? So the Student Ocean Ambassador Program, um, otherwise known as SOAP from now on, so I don't have to keep saying that mouthful, um, is, it, it was a program we started about four years ago. 
based on four concepts, hook them, train them, brain them, launch them. So we would try and get um, students to fall in love with the ocean in whatever shape or form that takes for them, scuba diving, stand-up paddling, surfing, uh, kayaking, uh, mangrove exploration, you name it. Fall in love with it, that's the hook and part. Train them, we, would, we had at one stage 96 fully trained lifeguards here at school amongst the staff <laughs> and students. That was a crowning glory, that was a, a quarter of the school pretty much. Um, so we want yeah. them to get proper certificates, uh, not just academic credits. Mm -hmm. And that's where the next step, the brain them comes in. We would try and pick out things in classes and deliberately, explicitly mention them so that they could see that that's the theory or that's the overarching academic um, uh, uh, material that's behind everything that they've seen when they go to the ocean. So sixth grade kids do a little bit of um, um, basic marine conservation studies and then if they go, you know, stand up paddle in Sonora Reef and, and spend the morning, you know, trooping around at low tide, checking out the, the coral reefs and the health of it, then they'll know a little bit more about what's going on. Um, and then the final bit was launch them, which was normally done simultaneously with the first one, which is you take the kids out to do something. So education at the service of the community rather than leeching off it. Um, for example, the surfers would have to do beach cleanups. The intermediate surfers did a wonderful thing called Surfers for Diversity, where they took um, kids with learning difficulties, autism, Down syndrome, they took them surfing as a way of giving them some sort of therapy and getting them to know the ocean. And honestly, the benefits, I, I don't know who got more out of it, whether it was the kids we were serving or our students who were serving them. So um, we took a big hit, obviously, when we couldn't go out on field trips. We couldn't get in a bus together. So we sort of, we reached out to our star students and um, we tried to get them to do more sort of flagship individual things at home. Um, or, or rather continue with their normal passions and keep telling us about it and keep feeding back to us because we couldn't go as a group but it doesn't mean you stop picking up trash when you go for a surf it means you, it doesn't mean you stop watching you know documentaries on Netflix not just movies that actually will educate you a little bit more about the state of the ocean and what you can do about it you know little things like uh, little little big things like uh, the Bali's biggest beach cleanup well, it's not a beach cleanup. The Bali's biggest cleanup, which is 19th of February every year. This year, instead of doing it with, you know, 50 people on the beach, we encouraged everybody to do it, you know, with their family in their area. And if they live by the beach, great. If not, you just clean up your village and, and post a photo of you and your close friends, your close community. So it was a, it was a, you know, the major things that we used to do together all got disbanded. Yeah, right. But it was nice to see that a lot of people didn't want to stop doing the things that they used to do and so they started just scaling them back and doing them in a you know and more homey two or three close friends their little pod of families and and it was really encouraging to see people are still doing it even though i'm not there to say don't buy palm oil snacks and yeah right you know so, I mean, ride your bicycle to the beach don't that's right you know. that's the true test when you're not actually being told yep exactly mm. it was really reassuring to see how many of our young ocean ambassadors were still, you know, in their own little way, in their little community, in their village, in their hobbies, still pushing the envelope, still awesome. as we say in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, well, that's pushing forward. Very satisfying to hear that. Uh, Rahayu, you mentioned going to Borneo was one of your um, your trips or plans. Sure. Of, yeah. What What about that? How did you How did you deal with that? Did you adapt yeah. something else or what? Sure. Yeah. Um, at the moment, like I was like. So sad because we're gonna go to Borneo, and then all of my uh, students also like are already excited. And then yes, we can go to Borneo and then see the orangutan and then see all the creature. But suddenly, no. <laughs> so I have a call with the Borneo uh, Nature Foundation, and then they are really kind to share like what is um, around the um, forest, and then maybe show a picture mm -hmm. of what is the creature that they have there. So that's really good. And then actually for this year, I'm going to uh, do the connection again with them. And then, yeah. Yeah, I've heard there's been quite a few classes, I think maybe in the primary school here where 
they got experts from zoos or nature preserves to actually yeah do tours live tours mm -hmm. so instead of doing the teacher call the teacher steps away and the yeah. and the expert comes on and does a, a guest appearance and I mean, it's very easy to do i think a lot of those types of places need to do something and are looking for things to do like that so yeah, yeah. awesome michael um green school anywhere um tell us about that that's something that i guess it's sort of moving into what's going on now what's what are we doing now and into the future in a nutshell, Green School Anywhere, what is it and what do you hope it to be? Um, I think I'll give you a little backstory is that when we were first transitioning to online learning, you know, our team was feeling very confident in being able to help our students with this transition. We found a platform that was really diverse and offered a lot of opportunities for students to share their learning in different ways, to provide instant feedback. and. Um, we also felt as if we could support students based on their individual needs. And once we launched and um, we were active online, we were absolutely dumbfounded by you know, the actual outcome. And we had students who were, we thought would thrive or struggling. We had families just ghost us and completely disappear. We had, we were left with students who were, were disconnected and feeling distant. Um, and it was, it was really hard. And I think it offered us an opportunity to refocus and to identify new and different ways um, to return to what we do best, which is connect. Um, and I think it also offered us the opportunity to kind of identify or develop a new and different uh, and truly unique way of approaching distant learning, distance learning. And that was based on the collective experiences of our educators and of our students. Um, I think the blueprint's the same. It's how do we integrate? How do we engage? How do we support social emotional well-being? Mm -hmm. um, how do we motivate change makers? Um, and from that, Green School Anywhere was born. And it, Green School Anywhere will be a collection of, of inquiry and skills focused online learning courses that culminate with a specific and direct call to action for students. And we're opening that globally, um, which is really exciting because it will provide an opportunity for students all over the world to be able to participate in the, the Green School experience. So we're really excited about that. Um, what's, what's the sort of time frame there, Michael? Is it going to be launching fairly soon or later in the year? or? Not sure yet, or is it something that is it something that you look look to be a, a long term project, not just a like one year thing, a longer term project? I mean, all of this information is super top secret, uh, so this <laughs> this won't be shared anywhere, right? Not going anywhere, okay, mate. Perfect. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, it's actually we're hoping to launch in the in the fall, in the the start of the school year. Um, but again, just stay tuned for what's to come with the the launch of Green School Anywhere. Awesome! Very excited to hear about that. Um, Okay, let, we've talked about what happened, what, what is happening and, and sort of was happening. Let's talk about going forward. Green School Everywhere sounds like an amazing thing that can work online, but not everybody is going to have access to something like that. Initially, there's going to be still uh, times where teachers have to be teachers and using those sort of tools, extremely important. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for that amazing thing to help us out, what do you guys see as the future of what we do like if we've learned something i know we've, we've learned that we can adapt we've learned that we can we can modify things to make programs work online we know that we have to bend like bamboo and make you know projects that are outdoors with big groups into smaller sort of um, more manageable um, family oriented things and bring them together what about big picture like what are those 21st century skills like do you, do you now think do you look at your curriculum or do you look at your scope and sequence and go I'm really just not sure if we need that anymore. I think may, or maybe we need that, but maybe we need that one a lot more now. I'd like to know what you guys think about, like what do you guys see is the most important thing kids need to, need to learn or need to experience now? Right now, in, right now in April 2021, right what, and going forward, do you see any changes? Is it the same old? Do we go back to what we were doing beforehand? Or do you I pray see we more? don't go back to the same old. Um, We've been, we've been, and anyone who's in education has been saying this since the industrial revolution, that education is due a bit of an overhaul. Um, if we go 
just if tomorrow let's imagine fictitiously you know everything opens and we can just go back to school the idea of going back to school is frightening me um i want to go forward to school i want to move i i think that's why we all came here right because we want to push education forward in a in a direction that we feel is you know merits our our efforts and our attentions you know if i think if we look at if we look at what we want for the future it's become really clear and obvious that the skills and the connection are so much more important like you said than the content especially when kids are so much more adept at finding the content by themselves mm. it's so much more important that we teach them the critical skills around that content so they can sift out the rubbish from the real gems because you know you go on to the internet and it's all there mm. it's literally all there yep. you know there are MIT courses for free you just don't get the shared experience well guess what covid got rid of the shared experience anyway good luck MIT uh, don't know how they're going to survive but thanks for sharing your stuff and i think that's what we need to do is uh, what are we sharing yeah and what is the connection you say something about we move into smaller family things i i'm hoping that families get something out of this period by having spent together i remember saying about halfway through i feel sorry for anyone who doesn't like the members of their family because they're stuck at home now yeah. with them for the next six months yeah. Yeah. and it's not going to go away anytime yeah. soon but um maybe even for people who you know have um, my my oldest is 12 and a half and he's hitting that age where we start to you know to fight in the normal way that you know parents and 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 young adolescents do and and i'm just so glad i'm there for that and one of the things i like most about teaching where my kids go to school is seeing them walking past seeing what their day to day looks like so i think there's a massive opportunity here for us to come back to family values mm -hmm. add some of those things that we i mean we look at, we talk about values here at school all the time um and and we sort of half expect the kids to come with those values front loaded and one of the things we've learned here at green school is everyone's so um so passionate about sustainability or or, or conservation or regeneration that when you get here you often you clash with other people because you don't agree on the way to it should be done and that in itself is you know it's a wonderful example of you know if i can be part of that at home and at school that's great and if we can keep that even when we go back to school let's go forward to school let's come with more of the stuff that we've learnt from home you know and let's discuss the values and the and the connections and the skills over the content mm -hmm. because content yeah it's there it will always be there mm -hmm. uh, you know I think there's a great opportunity to move forward in that direction. Yeah, what about, I mean, I can see that with what you teach, I can see it in literacy and I can, I'd like to know more about maths and science. I'd like to know how, whether you agree that content, there's parts of content that we need to keep on focusing on, but maybe there's more about the, the values and skills in maths and science. I don't know, Raha, you, what have you, do you think that's the future of what you do? Do you incorporate that into what you do? Um, you went in maths and science? Uh, yeah, absolutely. For math and science, like, I believe that the same thing with the other subject, like um, value, skill, that's the most important things. Because um, let's say at that moment, like it's still distance and then they trying to um, learn by themselves, you know. So they, they develop the skills, the adapt skill, think critically and think critically. So all skill and also values, how to um, share or how to connect not just like during the um, distant learning, not just during the call, but also how do you still connect with your friends? Because I like the idea that um, Francis said before, we um, start with the family, but also they as a student also had a friendship. They connect with their friends, how uh, it can possible, I mean, how we can connect with them, how they can, um, yeah, because usually not just family that influence that a lot, but also friendship. Because mm -hmm. somehow my student also shared to me like, I really wish that I could meet with my friends so they can help me and then we can discuss it a lot, so, yeah. Yep. Does well-being come in there? I mean, at this school, well-being is at the forefront of everything we do. Michael, is that something that you, I mean, I, I know it's something that you think about all the time with your teaching. What about with things like maths and what about with things like uh, tech, you know, any sort of tech studies? Like, how do you get well-being into those types of things? I think it's just a, a new and different medium for us to transition those those skills and values too right like if 
if we were doing something in, in the classroom that required students to document their feelings or their emotions or processing those uh, feelings and emotions, it's we're finding a different platform to, to share it. Um, and I think to extend on what Francis is saying, like when we're bringing those skills and values forward into hopefully coming back together, I think something that we need to adjust to is students have gained an incredible amount of resilience and perseverance throughout all of this. And I think that's something that we want to continue to help them cultivate and grow mm -hmm. along with as well. I suppose that's well-being, like checking in on everyone all the time and, and developing skills to deal with with any sort of uh, hardships that kids face. In fact, I mean, we've got a couple of questions coming in from our audience, um, and one of them relates to that, so I might, I might read that to you. It's from Amara in the, in the United States. Amara writes, how can you better support children who are not all thriving with distance learning? And she adds at the end, as a way of receiving credits in, edu in education. So I know in high school, receiving credits and making uh, what we do here at Green School uh, applicable to universities or future learning uh, areas is, a, is a, a big one. But let's focus on the first bit. Yeah, what, what, what do you guys do for kids who aren't finding it easy, or finding distance learning real, real, a real challenge? You know, you, you mentioned that some families switch off and, and leave, others stick around and it just feels like they're not really there. What, what sort of things have you, or techniques, or what? how do you approach that? I think that um, it, that requires more of kind of a one-on-one -on -one with with the student and with their their support network and being uh, continuing to you know like I said before to cultivate that relationship and I think it's also being flexible to the point where we can uh, look for opportunities based on their interests to be able to um, share and demonstrate. You know the skills that we're that we're looking for, and I think that's what where technology is so versatile in that sense is that again we have so many platforms that are available that can adjust to the the needs of of every individual student. So in a sense, we're able to almost you know again reach them a little a, a little bit more um, because of the 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 versatility that the technology offers. It doesn't make it any easier. Um, but again, we're you know we we are adapting to that, and I think you know supporting the student as a whole comes from 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 working with their family and working with the student as well. They they need to have a voice in it. Uh, if I can add Please. to that, so I really like the um, real time feedback that we have in high school. I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, because um, tell us more from, about that real time feedback. What's yeah, that? Yeah, um, real time feedback is. Um, like kind of like platform that we can like um, share our feedback throughout the kids, um, not just about like what their I mean knowledge, but also about the, their skill and their value. So from there, um, I mean the student can read, and then the parents also can read. So that's so really it's, ha it's happening sort of in real time. It's happening pretty yeah. regularly. Yeah, and it's, and it's every, on every two weeks. Every two every weeks. Two every two weeks, weeks they get yeah. descriptive feedback mm. that specifically references skills mm. and values, mm. the Green School skills and the Green School values. Oh, interesting. And, and it's, it's fun actually learning how to reword, you haven't done your homework <laughs> in, 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 in a positive light, which is uh, perhaps some work on your responsibility and integrity mm. need to be, yeah. needs to happen for your homework to be in on time. And it's, it, it, at first it seems a little bit like paying lip service and being a little bit, you know, artificial, but it is wonderful, the power of language, and if you shift from talking about your homework wasn't done and you are going to receive a zero and you are in, in danger of failing. I love this idea of, you know, a lot of, a lot of students have opted to get grades, but a lot of them will just have pass fail mm. at this time because we're not sure, uh, we're, sorry, we are sure that trying to cram content in is only going to have a negative result. So it's really, it's, it's actually quite fun finding, uh, uh, finding that we are in math uh, or language or tech or building stuff, finding ways to deliberately mention the skills behind handing your homework in on time. And that, isn't that much more important? You know, I don't know if, you know, uh, there was a ceremony in the house and, and, and the kid was up till four in the morning making Chanang and then the next day, you know, they had five other calls and things to do. But if if the value of, you know, being, being there for your community, 
if that's the value that you expressed on that day, then that's fine that you didn't do that piece of homework. In fact, that's really good that you, it's only one piece of homework. You're not going to fail the whole, the whole course of it. But instead of having that whole conversation about failing and not doing, you extol the virtues of any values that they are showing and mention the ones that they could work on a little bit more. Yep, yeah, that's right. And it's, um, I love the idea of having that constant feedback and it's something probably in primary school that happens uh, more verbally than, than, than written. But I love that sort of structure that's set up for it. So I think kids flourish when they get um, any sort of feedback, right? And um, if you can't do it in the classroom where you just go around and give them a, you know, a bit of verbal feedback constantly, that just has to be done that way. It has right? to be done that way. Um, another question came through. Um, what subjects can we offer to the children to create more awareness to what's happening in the world. Maria from the Philippines asked that. Well, I mean, at Green School, you know, sustainability, environmental studies is sort of the core uh, of, of what we teach. But not every school is like that. In fact, most schools probably aren't like that. Speaking to someone from a school, like a teacher from a school like that, what would you say, without, obviously without preaching what needs to be done, but what do you think is the most important thing that kids should be learning now and why not so much like sustainability or environmental awareness, but more like, can you drill down a little bit lower than that? Like we talked about connections, we talked about well-being, empathising, and what do you guys see as the most important um, thing to uh, going forward? Um, for me, um, I'll say um, like what issue that we have, like as, as human beings and also like what's around us. So something that I like from Green School, if I can share it. So in, at a high school itself, we have like certain team. We still have like math, we still have language, we still have um, other subject, but we uh, make it as a team. So let's say the first team about the climate change. So we trying to insert that climate change into our subject. And then the others about gender. And then others is about the, um, what I call it, Wallace learning and then everything. So we kind of like input it, like insert it into it. Little and teams, I believe things yeah. within, the, within the group. Yeah, within right. the group. And I believe also the primary and also middle school have a kind of like thematics. Where thematic yeah, learning. Yeah, yep. thematic yep. learning. So yep. I think that's really powerful and impactful. They're, yeah, not, right. they're, not, uh, they're not just like learning about the subject, but also they're focusing on and what is around you. How, how it connects to the local yeah. area and the, maybe the, the island and beyond. Yeah. Right. You guys, is that something that you guys think about too? Oh, thematic teaching is one of my favorite reasons for being at Green School. You get to, I mean, it's uh, for me professionally as a development tool, I've, I've never had anything better than spending six weeks with maybe two other teachers, one science, one literacy, one tech or something like that, and teaching around a theme. I think it's a really if you get the freedom to do this in your school, beg your directors or whatever it is to let you do this because you learn lots of really cool little tricks that you can use every day that you see your colleagues and you go, why didn't I think of that? So almost like a team, te team teaching team situation. Team teaching. Like you've, you've got this common theme. But you have an overarching theme and then everybody brings their passion around that theme and then, you know, in a healthy way, students see that we have different priorities, we have different, different uh, ways of approaching the thing, but we are all working around the theme of gender or identity or, or uh, okay. your use of social media. And I think this, it, it, thematic learning is the way forward for me. It's, uh, it, yep. it, it, so, and, and that's something that obviously can be done at home as well. What, what about... It's what you do at home. I mean, yeah. at home yeah. you don't compartmentalize your learning until you get to school. You do a little bit of everything. When you're singing, you're doing some math. You're also doing probably some physical movement. And, and I think if we can, we can jump more into that model of teaching, you'll find that the content will take care of itself because if you've got a teacher from each content area present, they're going to bring that side of the mm. thing into it. And you're addressing overarching themes, which is a nice way of getting students to look at oh we're learning because there is a bigger picture there is a real world out there and this theme exists in the real world and it's an important issue that we want students to have critical thought about to to engage with empathetically that we want them to develop so that when they leave us those themes are still in their head and they've got a lot of content and hopefully picked up on some of the passion along the way too what about um if you're trying to do that, 
what about collaboration? There's a question here from um, Sonia in Brazil. How can we promote collaboration among the students as we teach them remotely? So that's, I mean, I reckon that's one of the key um, tricks or areas that we need to work on, but it's very difficult. Michael, have you had any experience in promoting collaboration in your primary classroom? Um, yeah, again, I, I mean, I think it comes back to the idea of, of identifying tools and platforms that work best for you, for you and for your students. Um, and I think providing them with the structure of understanding the tools and features of those those platforms are, are incredibly important in having them dive deeper into the content and how they're using them and how they're sharing with them. Um, and again, I think then it, it comes to you know being able to share and, and communicate and with when you're working in these collaborative situations as well, where we want to encourage these relationships, um, where students feel that they they feel safe to make mistakes, they feel safe to share their ideas, and yep. that they'll be um, listening to these perspectives of others, and and including them in a, an idea that uh, may work better as a whole. But I think that a lot of teachers, including myself, are trying to do absolutely everything, and you don't have to do all the things. You find something that works for your class, um, you find something that works for you, and you immerse yourself in it, you immerse them in it, and that's where you get the connection and, and the true collaboration. Yeah, I'd second that. There's a, we don't have to do everything. And that highlights another value that we always talk about, which is trust. You know, breakout rooms, you give them the tools, you explain what you want them to do nice and easy, and then let them go. And mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's quite terrifying. Uh, I have 20 kids in my class, there's five groups of four, and I, I can only go from room to room. I literally am trusting them to do that, but making it explicit and giving them the tools, setting it up right. You know, sometimes maybe you have to disable the chat feature because you realize <laughs> that's not helping at all. It's like a sub conversation that's ruining the whole tone of the lesson. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, I think if you're explicit about it, I'm trusting you to do this. I want to see you. And one of the fun things about breakout rooms is sometimes you say, no, you don't get to go with who you want. And that's going to teach you the skill of community and empathy and integrity. You've got to, I'm going to press the button. It's going to put you in a group. Mm. random and then sometimes you cheat and you manually put them together because you know <laughs> who they will and won't be able to work with but um, it's it's a great way of mixing things up a little bit and like you say Michael not doing it all ourselves giving them some agency some ownership and yeah. saying you know uh, uh, if you spend the next 20 minutes goofing around and playing Minecraft in your breakout room that's what you did you yeah. own it when it comes to quiz time or when you don't have an answer, when we all come back into the main forum and we discuss and share opinions, then you miss out. Mm -hmm. The price is on you, you know, yeah. The, yeah. up to you. And the reward is also there for you. You can, even if you don't share when we come back to the main room, at least you've had your time to speak in a quiet group. I find it works really, really well for those shy students who will mm. never speak, mm. not online or in class, in a group of 20. Yeah, did you find You put them in a group of three, you yeah, go into the room, suddenly they're there, nah, 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 nah. it's wonderful. That's interesting. Just, Were there kids like that who flourished in with distance learning more so than you? So many yeah. surprises. Yeah. Kids that you would have thought would hate distance learning, absolutely loved it. Mm. And some kids who, you know, you really thought of as a, you know, quiet little person who loves studying at home by themselves, falling apart, begging for help, begging mm. for connection with other mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Some ghosting and leaving and if that happens, your best bet is to reach out to the family and say, try again, I'll put you in a smaller group or something. But uh, um, so many surprises. Did you find that, Rahay? Did you have people that behaved in yeah. different ways you weren't yeah, expecting? Yeah, the same thing. Like when we already make a like, clear setup, so they are like really engaged. Like I can share my experience from yesterday when I have a distant learning class. They just like talk. I don't know, like before they not look like that, but like everyone just like talking, hey, Burahayu, this is the thing. This is my idea. Hey, no, 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 this is my idea. And then I just let them to draw everything in their screen. And then I will see, oh my goodness, there's a lot of ideas that I have and then we discuss it together. And then, and then someone um, point out, oh yeah, now I get it. So this is my mistake that I had before. And then like, they're, I mean, her or his, I mean, friends, like helping them, yeah. you know? So that's really, 
Nice. It's very yeah. empowering for, yeah. for students to be able to help each other as well and to take a little bit of limelight for those who obviously it suits. Yep. Did you find that, Michael, with the younger grades where you had uh, some kids helping out other kids online, like not, not face-to-face, but supporting them? Yeah, I, I feel like some students actually kind of thrived in that environment in terms of uh, maybe not feeling the pressure of having everyone immediately within their surrounding, that they were able to offer opportunities for teaching kids how to access different technology or offering support if they didn't get something. And that's, again, where those breakout rooms came into, into play, and, and we mm-hmm. provided opportunities for students to take ownership and responsibility for, for their learning and for their classmates' yeah. learning. And it was really powerful. Yeah, that's right. And there was things, I, I remember there were things that we were doing that we couldn't do at school, which was a, a nice thing as well. We talked earlier about um, the possibilities. Um, things like, for example, interviewing your neighbour or interviewing mm-hmm. someone who works at your house or, uh, you know, doing some sort of active service in your community. And, and that's, a, you know, that's a task. Whereas at school, you can't really go and interview your neighbour or or have a chat with someone who works at your place. It's a, it's a more tricky sort of environment for that. What else? Like, what else was going on? What else worked? You know, what else just, you know, I think, Rahay, you talked about the catapult um, example. Did you guys have anything else that worked like that, that worked, that wouldn't work at school? It's, it's something that only would work at home. Yeah, I think there's, there's always the interview your granny. Since you've got to be online the whole time, you know, and, and you know, obviously you're getting square eyes from from playing games for too long. Since I've got to ask you to do something via the online platform, why not take advantage of the fact that probably you're stuck at home, you're a little bit bored, and you're in front of the computer. Hey, wouldn't it be useful if your English assignment for today also brings you a little bit closer to your granny, yeah. who's bored out of her head somewhere, who hasn't, you know, wasn't even allowed to go down to the bingo in the last two months, you know. It's a great way to, you, you, you cheat and kind of stuff the content in there, but with, with um, um, activities that, that will foster connection mm. and values over content. That's right. It's kind that's of like my big thing. There's two problems. There's, there's, there's Granny that's uh, bored because she doesn't get to see her grandkids. There's the kids who you want to get offline. Well, combine those two problems for a solution. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's finish with one more from um, Roberta in Brazil. What was the most special thing that you learned from this past 12 months that will continue to be part of your Green School program? I would love to know what you kind of have taken from this and what do you think is something that you will take with you to continue on once we go back and I should be clear that um, you know Green School has got a blended learning program where we're, we're doing a lot of uh, online learning we're doing some learning uh, on site uh, but there's also um, a big compromise between both ways of teaching as we move forward to on-campus learning around the world I'd love to know what, what it, what's your final kind of thought or piece of learning you've had as a teacher or as a human that you will take with you going forward? Um, I think for me it's, uh, it's been patience has, <laughs> has uh, been something I've been uh, I always felt that I yep. was able to recognize it in myself and practice but um, I don't think it was until you're on a Zoom call with, with 23 fourth graders um, <laughs> that you really recognize there's always room for growth um and but i also think that we come back to a point that i made earlier about uh, you know recognizing that through our interactions whether they're in person or online that we we always need to remember that um we only see a certain part of of the person and and uh, we need to recognize all of the external circumstances that may be impacting their choices in mm-hmm. within that conversation mm-hmm. or how they acting that day and I think to have patience and empathy and understanding um, is, I think, probably my biggest takeaway from the entire experience. Mm, interesting. What about you guys? Do you have a takeaway or something that will guide you along? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a wonderful reminder about lifelong learning. You know, there's, I, I, I was terrified of becoming an online teacher, even, you know, stamping my feet and swearing and saying, that's not what I signed up for. I'm an in-person teacher. I'm not an online teacher. Um, but I always fear change much more than I should. Mm-hmm. And I find that actually 
I thrive when I get a good challenge and, and I thrive on having just learned a little step, a new technological platform. I'm, I feel slightly less dinosaur and left behind. Um, it's terrifying to think that, you know, things will accelerate at such a crazy rate that I'm, you know, naturally becoming obsolete. But it's also nice to know that if you have your growth mindset, it's a real reminder to keep your growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you have that, you can take pleasure in learning a new trick. Mm. They say old dogs don't learn new tricks. I refuse to believe that. <laughs> and I'm going to make a point of just keep learning a new trick every so often. Mm. That's the best thing I'll take from it is yeah. uh, it, it's good not to be complacent. Mm -hmm. um, we say in Portuguese that if you run out of pleasure, you don't get tired. Quem corre por gosto não cansa. It's not true. You get exhausted, but at least you're happy, exhausted, and you feel like... What else are you going to do? Sit by and let it wash over you and go, I can't, I won't, uh, I don't know how. Those are actually just steps towards, you know, I'll try. Uh, uh, I, I will. I can. I did. Ooh. You know, and those moments for me, like the aha moment that you get in class, which you still get online, that moment where the kid goes, ah, and you go, ooh, that's what I do this for. You yeah. know, and you can feel that in yourself too. So I think... That's the thing I'd like to take forward. Keep yep. looking for those challenges. Keep looking for those aha moments. Yeah, work yourself to an early grave. <laughs> <laughs> right, Doing already. something you love, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. what, yeah, yeah, why not? I second also to Francis, like Goldman said, yeah, that's the first thing that we have to build, like in the beginning before we continue uh, to learning and, and teach subject and everything. And, um, I also, um, you said before that, yes, we have to adapt. I know that before I have no idea that like, we could like share or we could, we could teach like via Zoom or via Google Meet, but before I have no idea with that, but now, yes, there's a lot of option. There's mm -hmm. a lot of possibility that we can do. And then something that I love also to keep it um, whenever we are back to school. So probably the real time feedback. That is really impactful, yeah. Yeah. not just for me, like mm -hmm. sharing it with them, but also for the parents, for the student also to develop, not just like, hey, you get this, yeah. no, but they, they can learn from their mistake. Yeah. They can do something else. So that is the, the great thing that we can keep it. And also probably since we know that there is all, I mean, a lot of possibility outside and with the technology, right, um, probably we could do like the same thing, maybe tour but like outside, so let's say we cannot go there, so we could do that as an option. Yep. So yeah, I love something. it. Yeah, I love that. On uh, The real-time feedback is fantastic. Guys, thank you for joining me here in this beautiful space. I really enjoyed chatting with you. I can see right now. Um, if nothing else, I think uh, one thing I've learned is not taking anything for granted. And I, I think every day that I uh, go online and have an aha moment or a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of time together uh, like this, even just what we're doing now, I'm certainly not taking it for granted seeing your beautiful faces and, and just chatting about things that we all love. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. If you've enjoyed today's um, chat, um, I'd encourage you to go online and check out the Green School Everywhere, uh, sorry, the Green School uh, Educators course. Now that's a, uh, a course that shows you how Green School um, work sustainability and environment into our everyday teaching. Uh, there's a couple of different options. Um, there's a blended course or a self-paced course, and that piques your interest. Please go to the chat where we'll put in uh, some links to this course, and maybe it's something that you might want to investigate so that you can have uh, something to show for this time online and make it work into your teaching as well. All right, it's time for us to get back into our teaching, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody out there, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>